Let's start with a quick check on the Dalal Street. The market started January series on a strong footing led by positive global cues. The Nifty flirted with the 10,900 mark but failed to sustain at that level. That index ended with gains of about three quarters of a percent. Sensex managed to hold on to the 36,000 mark despite selling pressure in the last hour. Banks reclaimed the 27,000 mark led by a gain of a percent while mid-caps rallied about a percent. Sirbi Ubhadeya joins in now with a wrap of today's trading action. Sirbi, good day for the bulls clearly. Well, pretty good way to end the last trading week of the year. Uh, in fact, a good day and a good week, we can say that. Uh, gains that were widespread, so the Nifties managed to go home with an up move of almost seven-tenths of a percent. Uh, the good part is that buying was very well spread out throughout the large-cap basket and even the mid-cap basket. And the market breadth was quite strong through the course of the day. And we didn't see too many gyrations. We didn't see too much of volatility today. So let me run you through the stock movers. Great day for a couple of the jewelers, uh, with Titan really leading from the front. Perhaps it's a rub off on you know, the, the rise that we're seeing in gold prices. But Titan was up almost 5% as we were closing out. Sun Pharma and IOC were some of the other key gainers of the day. Good day for a lot of or a, a lot of metal stocks, both on the ferrous and the non-ferrous side. So the likes of Vedanta, JSW Steel, Hindalco, all of them up between 1% and 2 to 2.5%. Financials continue to be a strong pillar today, whether you're looking at an NDFC like a Bajaj Finance or the banks. Uh, yes Bank, uh, of course, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank and HDFC itself. So financials Absolutely not a problem for the market. Now, what was weak then? Couple of names. Coal India was consistently down, ended about 3% lower. Uh, BPCL was on the other side. So divergence between how oil marketing companies have really traded today. And it was important to note the selling or the profit taking rather that was coming in stocks like Infosys and TCS. Towards the end of day, they started coming to ground zero. Mid-caps had a flying session, particularly in the second half in the afternoon. I'll give you some, some examples. Avenue Supermarts, almost 5% on the higher side. Lemon Tree, very strong and very consistent right from the morning. They've got lots of new ideas. They're setting up uh, housing for students, housing for working professionals. So an interesting conversation with the management there. Uh, Reliance Capital and a couple of other ADAG group stocks found takers today. Sun TV was uh, quite a mover, almost 5% higher. And Page Industries, late surge, but it's a big stock and it moves smartly higher. So all in all, great way to end the last week of 2018. Oh, absolutely. That is a great way to end the last week of 2018, Surbhi. Thanks for joining in. Of course, two more days left on Monday and Tuesday. And let's see if equities and bulls sustain that momentum. But from equities, let's uh, quickly take a look at the currency action. Slight recovery for the Indian rupee as it opened higher by 30 paise at 70.05 per dollar after Thursday's close of 70.35. The strength was aided by foreign fund inflows and a weak dollar as investors turned their focus to safe haven currencies like yen and the Swiss franc. From currency to crude, oil prices are seeing a strong recovery from Thursday's loss. Brent is trading with gains of over 2% to trade over $53 per barrel. WTI and IMX is up close to about two tenths of a percent at that $45.5 per barrel mark. However, prices remain close to their lowest levels in more than a year as investors are clearly worried about rising U.S. inventories and concerns over global economic growth. But the big interview back home, inflation is at the lower end of the Monetary Policy Committee's range and therefore nominal interest rates need to commensurately go down. That's the word coming in from the Principal Economic Advisor, Sanjeev Salia. In an interview with Lata Bankadesh today, Sanyal also said that small businesses were facing real interest rate of 10% as he made the pitch for a rate reduction. The Principal Economic Advisor also talked about farm distress and stressed on the need to reduce the cost of capital for farmers. Here is an excerpt of that interview. We need to make sure that the fact that there is this excess is leading to food prices being under continuous mm. uh, pressure, pressure downwards. That's right. We need to deal with that. Mm. There are a few things we, we need to take uh, into account. Mm. One is we need to make sure that these food prices are held up in some ways. And MSB is one mm. way of doing it. But also remember that the farmers mm. are also facing very high cost of capital. Mm. So their output, which is food and other agricultural products, mm. they're in that inflation for that is essentially at zero right now. Mm. And they are all borrowing at more than 10%. Yeah. So the real interest rate for them mm. is over a thousand basis points. Mm. So we need to begin seriously about reducing the cost of capital. Mm. In fact, in some ways, mm. this is the source, if you think about it, for the demands mm. you see mm. for farm waiver and other uh, yeah. farm loan waiver, etc. This is the source of it. The cost mm. of capital is very expensive. By the way, not just for farmers, mm. for small businesses and many others as well. Yes. 
So this is one big area. Like you said, uh, uh, that we've got a severe food disinflation, which has actually been surprising. Uh, one thought that MSPs would perhaps increase the prices, that has not happened. And now to add to that, we also have a fuel disinflation. So what do you look at in terms of uh, uh, you know, how much uh, uh, rate cuts can come? We already have a fairly comfortable liquidity with the Reserve Bank promising uh, 50,000 crore of uh, uh, bond purchases, uh, December, Jan, Feb and March. Uh, to add to that, how much space for rate cuts do you see in 2019? Uh, for, firstly, let me clarify that this is really the um, prerogative of the Monetary Policy Committee. So mm. I can't um, comment on exactly how much they should uh, cut. Mm. But I can lay out the mm. landscape. Okay. Uh, basically, inflation is now running at the bottom of the... Uh, range uh, that the uh, Monetary Policy Committee had been given mm. and uh, we have now, it's just not something new, we have mm. now had for some time mm. uh, inflation uh, running at or below the midpoint of that range. Opposite. So inflation I think has structurally come off. I think it's fair to say mm. that the old uh, 7 or 8 to 10 percent range mm. uh, that we of inflation that we used to have, okay. that has been lowered by some good you know, five, six hundred basis points. Mm. Um, so, if that is the case, mm. we need to see a commensurate reduction mm. in the nominal interest rates. Otherwise, mm. you mm. have real interest rates running about the highest in the world. Mm. I mean, small business still borrows at 12 percentage points, right? Mm. Mm. Now, if inflation is running at 2 percent, that's a thousand basis point uh, real, um, interest real interest rate. Clearly, uh, some, yeah, 1,000 basis point, at least an 800 basis point real mm. interest rate for large parts of the economy. Mm. This is clearly not tenable because of a variety of reasons. First mm. of all, mm. this is a source of <clears throat> enormous financial stress to the balance sheets. Mm. So this is a major problem for um, small business, large business, mm. for farmers. After mm. all, farmers can also be seen as small business mm, yep. um, and so on. It also causes stress on our fiscal side mm. because the government is, the, after all, the biggest borrower yep. from the system. So it is a stress on the fiscal side. <clears throat> but also, ironically, mm. keeping high interest rates over long periods of time also increases inflation. Mm. This is something that economists tend to forget. Okay. That while high interest rates in the medium term lowers inflation, mm. in the long run, High interest rates mean that you do not build capacities Fair that you point. would have otherwise built, mm. whether infrastructure, in, in industry and so on. Mm. So you end up with higher supply side inflation mm. in the long run yep. if you keep interest rates high indefinitely irrespective mm. of where inflation is. Yep. So I think we have structurally brought down inflation. Mm. We now need to take step two and structurally bring down the interest rates mm. so that they are in sync with the new level of uh, inflation. Mm. And that, when I say when we have to think in hundreds of basis points now yep. they exactly what trajectory the MPC takes of course is their prerogative mm. no a fair point it's just that uh, uh, I, I would assume that then MPC would be convinced of uh, the food disinflation that they have seen and the fuel disinflation especially if uh, you know crude continues around this $55 mark uh, uh, all the way up to February when the MPC meets next. But more importantly, they will worry if fiscal deficit is higher than they thought. Uh, for instance, we have seen a spate of farm loan waivers coming in from the state governments. In addition, if a big package comes from the center, that would be a spot of bother for MPC, won't it? So I, I would argue that you know the, the, you cannot see these things in isolation. You know, the, I mean, one of the points I make in my new book mm. is that uh, the, you have to think about the system in, 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 in a holistic way mm. because the, everything is connected. Yep. If you keep real interest rates at these high levels mm. for the farmers, mm. naturally there will uh, be pressure to uh, do farm loan waivers, waivers and other things. Okay. So you make cost of capital exceptionally high, mm. then it feeds through, to, you know, the imbalance shows through somewhere in the system. Sure. So the point is once you have lowered uh, food prices uh, and inflation generally, you have to allow the rest of the system to adjust. Mm. Otherwise, the political pressure or other economic pressures will show up somewhere. Okay. So these are not unconnected things. Okay. All right, on to an exclusive then. Government is tightening the news around people who are evading GST by using bogus bills. Sources tell us that the government has tasked field officers to keep a strong vigilant tax evaders. We also learned that the government has made few arrests in Delhi. Let's go across to my colleague, Timzi Jepuria, for more details. Timzi, what states are seeing a rise in bogus bills and what is the quantum of such tax evasion exactly? 
Even as government is trying to meet uh, the daunting GST target, tax evasion is something which has started bothering the government and government has started taking action also against it. What we understand from sources is the fact that government has now tasked all the field formations to keep a strong vigil against uh, tax evaders under GST and it feels that bogus billing is one of the major areas through which tax evasion is happening. Pan-India government has identified about 10,000 odd crore rupees of tax evasion being done only through bogus billing. That too from uh, states and cities like Delhi, Chennai, Himachal Pradesh, UP and Gujarat which are the, some of the prime areas through which bogus billing is uh, happening. Also government feels that MSMEs uh, are trying to uh, are being used for this bogus billing so that they can claim refunds which is an undue refund for them and yes not just this about 2000 odd crore rupees of uh, bogus billing is currently under investigation where government has also started making some arrests uh, when it comes to the bogus billing uh, uh, exercise being adopted by the tax evaders. So let's see how soon government tries to catch hold of GST tax evaders and what is the final figure, how much of GST tax evasion gets back into the system. Back to you.